Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Yang, co-creator, executive producer, and writer of the Emmy Award-winning series, Master of None. And I'm here to have an intimate conversation with two of Netflix's top contending Emmy showrunners, whose critically acclaimed series permeated the zeitgeist in ways we've never seen before this year. 63 million viewers worldwide fell in love with The Queen's Gambit, while chess sales catapulted through the roof and young women and girls clamored to be the next Beth Harmon. When the fourth season of The Crown premiered, Social chatter reached new heights as TikTok and Instagram influencers took to the platforms to reenact famed scenes of Queen Elizabeth, Princess Diana, and Margaret Thatcher. I'm so excited to welcome today creator, showrunner, EP, and writer of The Crown, Peter Morgan, and creator, EP, and director of The Queen's Gambit, Scott Frank. I want to start at the beginning, right? I want to start with writing, process, the genesis of both of these shows. Scott, I'll start with you. I read that it took you over a decade to adapt this book and it was initially going to be made into a film. Uh, it was you suggested it was going to be a limited series. Talk to us. What initially motivated you to take on this project that, you know, is about this very specific world, the story of a female chess prodigy in the fifties and sixties? Um, I tried to adapt the book. Bill Horberg, the producer, had um, given it to me late nineties, I think it was, and we tried to get it made as a film and. As you can imagine, there wasn't a lot of interest back then in this this sort of film. Um, and it had been the book was published in eighty three, and many many directors and writers had tried to do it, uh, beginning with Bernardo Bertolucci and others. They'd all tried to make it into a film with various casts. I think at one point Molly Ringwald was going to do it, and so on. But I had my first script was something about a, a young child genius, and I'd always been obsessed with the sort of cost of that. And I thought this book did it better than my own script had done. And I thought it was really fascinating. And yet there was no lane for it as a movie. And as television began to change, um, thanks to people like Peter and you, and they were taking more risks, a lane opened up in the, in the world of streaming, in particular in the world of limited series, which, which before was something that was not seen as particularly viable, on, particularly on broadcast. So... I thought this is the way to do it. I just made a limited series for Netflix before and I realized I need to go back and revisit The Queen's Gambit as, as um, in that format. And that's really what, what precipitated all of this. So fascinating. I think that's a common story amongst filmmakers, writers, directors. Television and, and streaming especially is becoming the new venue for, for stories like this. So Peter, you know, similar question to you. You've been no stranger to covering the royal family especially Queen Elizabeth II. You wrote the script for the Queen, of course, in 2006, and later the, the play, The Audience, which won Helen Mirren a Tony Award. What made you want to devote an entire series to this topic? Was it similar to Scott? Just the, the, the right venue, the right, the right uh, sort of premise and format? No, with me, it, it came, it, it was slightly different. So I really enjoyed writing the audience scenes between Blair and the Queen in the movie. And, and then that led to a play where I wrote audience scenes for a number of the prime ministers and, and uh, uh, enjoyed that a lot. And in particular, I enjoyed writing the audience scene between the new, brand new queen with Winston Churchill, who was her first prime minister. And, and I loved that sort of grandfather-granddaughter relationship. And I thought, Wow, I, I'd quite I, I'd, I'd like to write it a little more, and so I I initially started exploring it as a film, and I thought what a what a great two hander to be able to 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 do you know because it's not often you get to do a sort of grandparent grandchild relationship, and and that seemed to be a particularly interesting sort of educating Rita, uh, with you know, uh, and 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 then as I did that I, I stuck. I, you know, beginnings and endings are so important. And, and every time I thought I'd found a good beginning for it, whether it was her becoming queen or her having her first audience scene or, or Churchill having a particular moment of, uh, close to the end of his life, I realized that I hadn't gone back far enough. And I kept going, I kept thinking, well, no, that isn't the beginning. The beginning is a little earlier when the father dies. What is it like to lose a father and then realize you become queen? So I kept moving the end point and moving the beginning point until it actually became a little bit longer and a bit longer. And then what happened was I realized that it was even more riveting to explore the journey of a young queen. And then as that started to gain momentum, it just started to grow and grow and grow. And then at one point I thought it'd be interesting to do just three seasons, a young queen, a middle-aged queen, and an old queen. 
So by the time I actually came to Netflix in January in 2014, when Netflix was still just operating out of a porter cabin in, in Beverly Hills, um, you know, uh, uh, the idea was already then to do six seasons. So when we, when we walked in, it, it was a six season idea, um, you know, from its inception in a funny way. Well, th there's another topic I'd like to hit that that's kind of very near and dear to my heart, because I, I think we're one of the few comedies on TV that does a lot of research. And, and obviously, you know, there's probably a fantastic amount of research that goes into both your shows. Uh, Peter, this season of The Crown showcases the new era for the monarchy and obviously introduces two iconic characters, Princess Diana and, and Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister. Um, I'm sure all that research was, was really, really extensive. When writing the script for season four, what was essential to include for both women? And, you know, what did you feel could be left out? Well, the leaving out question, that part of the process takes more time and more energy and more concentration than anything else. And, and when, when you come to it, you first, you just have bad ideas, you know, and, and I have to write the bad ideas out of my head. And so the storylining process takes forever because the things that come to you instantly are almost always terrible. And, and, and so, uh, you know, um, I think of it as one of those bath tap, you know, a, a bath tap in, a, in, in an old English country house where you turn it on and just rust colored water comes out for the first five minutes, just filthy water. And then you just need to run and run and run and run. And so I, I do that for about six to eight, uh, six to eight months per season is just the writing out of my first, because history is so reductive that when we first have an idea about a decade, we go to the, to, to the tent pole, greatest hit events. Obviously you have to include some of those because without them, a decade wouldn't be that decade, but it's the stuff around it and the surprising stories. And with Thatcher, that then involved looking at her as a mother, exploring her as a, as, as a wife and a mother, as a fat, you know, as well as the iconic leader that she became and turned into during the course of her, you know, her time as prime minister. The way the crown is done is less like a conventional writer's room. Uh, I, 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 I have about a dozen people who work as story editors, as researchers, and I speak to them by Zoom every morning at, at 10 o'clock. And, and, and that's very much, it isn't a writer's room, it's a researcher's room, it's a story laboratory. They keep me on the straight and narrow. They, they, they break my heart because the things that I hope happened turn out never to have happened. And they, they're, they, they're the spinning blue lights of, of factual uh, you know, correctness. And, and, um, and so that, that, that twilight between dramatic invention and historical reality and fact is is it's the push pull between me and, and and the team the whole time and and they are my closest companions and colleagues on the show i i love that metaphor of the bathwater and getting that all out i think i i, I read something that stephen king said once which was you know he's not building a story he's he's uncovering a fossil and he's 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 wiping away dust and dirt every day every day and eventually he finds the skeleton of the story i I, I love both of those metaphors. I think they're they're so they're so incisive. And Scott, for you, you know, obviously you have this book and you have you know, this Walter Tevis book, and the material is there. But again, what what is your process in terms of adapting? Because it's it's not trivial. This process of turning a book into something filmed is so difficult in so many ways. What what was your sort of ethos going into it? Very similar to when I would write something original, you know, and this notion what Peter was describing of doing research and spending six to eight months. It's not just getting through the bad ideas, it's also figuring out what it wants to be. You know, I don't do outlines. I just sort of write about it over and over and over again. I just keep writing about it and I accumulate pages. I'm not doing so much like um, character bios and things. I'm just writing about the story and then uh, I kind of- what, what does that look like, Scott, when you say you write about it? What does it's that just like? prose. It's just kind of off, the top of my head, things I know, here's a scene I know has to be in it. Here's something, here's some dialogue. If it's an original, I just do that all from either research, because I, I actually have a researcher that, uh, Mimi Munson, who's worked for me for over 20 years. And so we're talking back and forth and I'm adding to this soup and then I'll begin to shape it. I'll cut things that I thought was, a, you know, my, this might've been a good idea, but I don't have an outline so much as a kind of document that I refer to. And if I'm stuck, I can go back and read it and rem remind myself of things I love, a tone and a feeling, because it takes on its own 
its own shape and its own um, its own its own feel. With the book, I really had to sort out the tr the challenge. Every book has a different challenge. Every story has a different challenge. This one was just how do you make chess cinematic? If I had done this as a movie, I think it would have been a sports story, pure and simple. Is she going to win or is she going to lose without any of the other kind of relationships? There wouldn't have been time. And the good thing about the limited series is that you're really adapting a novel into another kind of novel. So like Peter said, you're trying to you only know what doesn't work by doing it. I have I can't guess. I need to see it work. I need to. And the more we do it, the more we believe that ideas are instantly transparent. We can see what's wrong with them right away. And so we want to kill them. And you have to be careful of that, too. You know, sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes you need to live with something um, and just explore it to make sure it's it's not right. And basically, it's time. And that's why the whole setup of how of having to work so fast and deliver episodes and shoot while you're writing. I don't think I could ever, ever do that. I wouldn't know how to do that. I, I feel like I've come from both worlds and it's, I much prefer having it done. I much prefer having the script done. It's, it's uh, pretty terrifying. You terrified me when you said you don't outline it all, but then you described the whole process of the soup. You're kind of, you know, you're kind of making the stew and, and that is, you know, to me, that blue sky process is such a part of it. Peter, for you, what is your mundane daily routine? What is your process as you, as you go about making the show? Like, like Scott described for us. I write in the mornings uh, and uh, I get up early and that, that's just when I function, it turns out. And, um, uh, and then I do outline actually. I outline because I need to share something instantly intelligible with the group of people that I'm working with. It sounded much more jazz improv like what what scott was talking about and if i were to do that it might be a harder it might be a harder roadmap for uh, for, for a community to follow and i'm very much walking in step with the community as i do my process and then we do readings so what we do is as pretty much as soon as i've got a draft ready we read them and we are every single one of us is constitutionally unsuited to reading and performing we are you know, it, it, there are a bunch of quite academic people and quite shy and quite private people and are murderously untalented as readers. And, and so if they met, if the script remotely stands up in the hands of these appalling readers, I mean, I remember we had a, a fellow who was very shy and with a bit of a stammer who was playing Churchill, which just, you know, and, and we've got completely inappropriate people playing inappropriate things, but if it, it's amazing how it throws the episode into, it, it, it's a kind of brutal thing. It's like shining a very sharp light on it. And, and for some reason, I can hear instantly what's wrong. And so that saves us from the, the studio note process, which they're very kind to leave us alone. And, and, and actually means that the scrutiny is, is very rigorous. I, I don't know how many drafts we do in every episode. Uh, uh, apparently one recently we I, I asked I said how many do we do and we were on like 37 draft you know it's just deranged and like Scott I don't because I grew up and I think this is pertinent for the era that we're in now which is that we're in this era of cinematic television it's a very it's very exciting to watch and I think the pandemic has accelerated it and I think Queen's Gambit and the Crown have been in many ways the beneficiaries of it but we are now in a streaming hyperverse, you know? <laughs> and the skill set required to tell the most satisfying stories in the most satisfying forms are part cinematic and part, and part theatrical and part, you know, uh, uh, television. And, and, and I'm, I count myself so lucky that I had been writing television and had been writing movies. And certainly the process that we do the only process that I understand that we, when we make the crown is very is so similar to what we were doing with what I would call mid-range movies, those adult dramas that that, that I was involved in, like Frost Nixon or, or The Queen or Last King of Scotland. The way we make the crown is no different. We're, that's how we're doing it. We're, we're not doing it in the paradigm of a television show. We're doing it in the paradigm of a feature film. You know, we're behaving like people. If you, if you, you know, the, the the level of attention and and and, and scrutiny and some. May, say indulgence because we take our time to get it right it feels like we're trying to make a 10-hour film yeah and to go from 
the, the, the worst cast possible in those reads to the best cast possible must be a, a stark difference. Can you talk a little bit about both of you, how you're involved with the casting process, you know, being the creators and showrunners of these shows? I think showrunning is five. I, I, I've come to believe that it's about five or six full-time jobs. And, and therefore, you have to sort of accept that you can only do some of those. And, and I do two full-time jobs, really. You know, uh, you know, I'm not across. I have wonderful partners and colleagues, Suzanne Mackey, Michael Casey, Una Roban, who are the producers of The Crown, right? They run the show. I'm called the showrunner, but it's preposterous, really, because I'm only, I'm only doing, I'm, I, you could call me the creative showrunner, but I in no way run the show. Well, first, I just have to say, Peter, the, the crown looks like a movie. It feels like a movie. It behaves like a movie. Everything in it is a movie. And I'm, I'm really kind of dumbfounded that we still talk about a lot of this stuff as a different thing. There's something sentimental about preserving this line between you know, movies and series, and um, I shot everything as I would a film. I really want to get dug into this, you know, this whole business of where we are and what's happening to the mediums and how, where, where is cinema and where is, yeah, because I'm, you know, we're coming out of this now and how, is theatre going to be unchanged and what happens? And it feels like the medium of television is moving in step with it feels like we're moving and we're changing and we're evolving and that movies and theater are frozen and are saying it's gonna come back it's gonna come back and i'm sitting there going i don't think it is it might but it but i and television is moving 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 it's unbelievable it's now the new television is moving so fast what is so strong about queen's gambit is the signature it just screams signature voice you cannot uh, the clarity and the confidence of its uniqueness. You know, it's a, it's a thumbprint. It's, and that's what's so gorgeous. You were so in sync with your art director and its singularity is what is such a joy to watch. We, we, we're not watching anything that has been contaminated or neutralized or made beige. Um, it, 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 it was a really strong... And the challenge with a long-running thing is how to keep... A, a, and so, you know, in how to keep a, a signature voice. And I think with directors, when they come on, when they come on the crown, they know that they're becoming part of a of a collective thing. And and I urge them, each of them, to bring ten percent that no one else has brought. You know, they they cast their individual episodes. Uh, you know, not main cast. The main cast will have been done. And I think whoever sets up the first couple of episodes, the first block, as it were. Once the actors have been directed that there, the actors are then in possession of their characters. And the actors pretty much then know by the time they've done two or three hours, they are custodians of their own characters. These, you know. Yeah. Well, the one thing that you just said, I mean, thank you. But the, the irony is in order to achieve a really singular point of view, you it takes a lot of people. The other thing that I like about your process is, is it's not a writer's room, it's a sandbox that everybody plays in. And that sounds great. That sounds different than, you know, um, a bunch of people sitting around competing with one another, you know, thinking about lunch and, you know, whatever else. Also, it's, been, it's the same bunch. We've all, yeah. there's been no churn on the Crown staff, pretty much. We've been together for eight years. That's because of you. That's because that's... You know, but it's, it, it's a really lovely feeling. Absolutely everybody is still there. Pretty much all the heads of department are still there. It is this gorgeous, comfortable bubble of care. You know, that's what it feels like. And same question for you, Scott, especially when it came to casting Anya Taylor-Joy. You know, what, what was that process like? It's such an such a iconic role for her. So in casting... Um, you know, it's the one thing you cannot fix in post. If you have miscast, you're, you're in trouble. And you may even miscast a terrific actor who's just the wrong actor. And thankfully, I don't think that's ever happened to me because I'm so worried about it. And I take so much time thinking about it. Although there are moments where somebody walks in the room and sits down and you go, oh, that's, that's them. I feel them. That's them. I don't need to hear them read because they are. That's, I know they can do that. That happened on the first film I ever directed with Joseph Gordon-Levitt and it happened with Anya Taylor-Joy. 
she just walked in and the restaurant and um, sat down and I knew that this was the right way to go. Casting is everything and Ellen Lewis, who I've worked with on the last few things is, you know, she's amazing. Um, and Olivia Scott Webb in Britain, because a lot of our cast was, you know, British, a ton of them. We cast from both the United States and even a little bit in Germany. But um, that process for me is the process of working with the actors is my favorite part of directing. And if you're prepped, if the script is good, just creating this whole other level on the set with these people, a whole separate thing, you know, you have the script you can lean on. There's a script you all agree upon, which you've, you've talked about. You're helping keep them sort of located in the story. And so now you can play. I've prepped every shot. I know what we're going to shoot. I have spent, you know, months and months. I always bring um, cinematographer in earlier than they'd like to spend because I really want to prep. And that leaves room. If you know what you're going to do, you can, the actors can improv or do something different that you didn't think of because we had a plan. Now we can, we can do something else. We can chase it. We have the security of being able to let people do their thing and everybody has to do their thing. Everybody has to feel like they're enabled. And if everybody sees the same thing, it's, it's a great, it's a great feeling. One thing I wanted to say, which I find interesting is that I, the challenge I get with is that when you cast three different actors to play the same part, okay, what happens is one actor, you know, they will bring a particular aspect, you know, a, a real delicacy and a vulnerability. And the next time you cast someone in exactly the same role, the older version, and just by virtue of the fact that they are who they are and all the life experience that they have as a human being, they're, they're coming in and they're bringing something different to it. And so it's very organic. The part changes and you have to respond to that because the actor is bringing the actor. The actor suddenly brought so much more to it. And because I was prompted to think of that when Scott was talking about when someone just walks in the room and they have that, you know, um, and then you have to adjust that because the actors bring what they're bringing in the, in my case, there are existing characters which have been played by other people leading up to that. And that is a really, that's the process that I'm in at the moment. We've just started shooting season five. And I'm looking at the first rushes coming in and thinking, gosh, that character's really gone in this direction now. And, and how exciting. And so now I'm having to write with, you know, like it's like one leg is shorter than the other and you're writing according to that, you know, that, that act is bringing in a natural aggression or a natural uh, delicacy or vulnerability that you hadn't imagined before. That's kind of exciting. That's like, you, you, have, to, you have to address that in real time. This, is, this has been so fascinating. I, don't watch, I want to ask you a million more questions, but we're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you to both of you. It's been an honor talking to both of you about your process. Um, Again, I'd love to dig in more. Scott Frank, Queen's Gambit, Peter Morgan, The Crown. Watch these shows. They're brilliant shows, and they're the result of so much hard work, not just from the two of you gentlemen, but by fantastic cast and crew. So, you know, give these shows a watch, and thank you both so much.